Great, thank you. Um, let me welcome you to our third session today with the Risk Management Symposium. The session is called Reconstruction and the Challenge of the, Jap the, Challenge of the Japanese Economy After the March 11th Disaster. Our moderator today is uh, Takatoshi Ito from the University of Tokyo. Mr. Ito, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, this is session three, and um, uh, you know, it'll be uh, quite different from the session one and session two. And this is a um, uh, session by economists, and I'm not sure what kind of um, uh, prejudice uh, you, you, you have um, for or against um, uh, economists, but we will talk about more um, uh, cost aspects, how to pay for uh, the disaster. So let me introduce the uh, uh, session uh, uh, panelists. Um, from here, the Jimmy Chimori, who's um, uh, Kyoto University uh, Vice President, and uh, he will talk about the um, earthquake uh, short run, long run effects. The second will be uh, Etsuro Shioji, uh, who's a Hitotsubashi University uh, uh, economist who's uh, visiting uh, Columbia University uh, this semester. And uh, uh, Dr. Martin Bailey, who's a Brookings uh, Institution uh, uh, economist, uh, who served um, uh, Council of Economic Advisors some time ago. So, um, uh, including myself, the four uh, different views uh, on the economic aspects of the, uh, uh, this 3-11 uh, uh, disaster. And uh, we will put more emphasis on the fiscal impact, fiscal uh, uh, problem, which will be caused or added by the uh, uh, disaster. Okay. So um, uh, first, um, I have to uh, uh, um, sort of apologize that, um, um, yeah, I, I think the, you may move back to, uh, yeah, or turn around, that's fine. Okay, so first I have to um, kind of, as a Japanese, I have to apologize first that, um, apologize for the narrow focus that um, uh, we will focus on very narrow economic um, aspects. And although we are social science, but we uh, sort of um, uh, abstract many aspects of the social uh, 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 problems, uh, but narrowly focus on the economic, especially fiscal uh, uh, impact. Second, that we will, um, we will talk about uh, disaster management rather than risk management, that um, uh, we, we take the uh, disaster as a given and we'll talk about what to do about it uh, rather than how to uh, prepare for the next, um, uh, next disaster, except um, I, I have one comment on, on that. Um, then um, uh, we will talk about the disaster cost, how much cost that we have to, uh, we have to pay for and how we calculate the uh, costs and uh, reconstruction for the reconstruction. Then uh, uh, we'll have some uh, discussions on the reconstruction plan. What kind of cities and towns we would like to uh, uh, re re reconstruct? And uh, there we, we will make some distinction between restoration and reconstruction. Restoration is that we restore what you know, the towns and cities we used to have. And reconstruction is that we may create something new and something different from what we used to have. Then uh, we'll talk about financing, uh, uh, financing costs and how to fund those uh, costs, how the government uh, pays for those costs. Uh, in the session one, session two, we uh, rarely heard about how much it would cost and who pays for it. But that's the focus of this session, uh, session three. Then uh, uh, three of us are from Japan and we, we, we will talk about the situation that Japanese government uh, is in, which is not very good uh, uh, from the uh, debt and, and deficits point of view. And there, they, uh, uh, Dr. Bailey will come in and, and talk about uh, U.S. situation. Although U.S. didn't have the disaster, but the, uh, they have very similar sort of uh, fiscal situation. 
And uh, this fiscal problem, uh, as you know, the, uh, Europe, Europe is also suffering from. So we'll talk about some global perspective, the uh, fiscal problem, why we have such a fiscal problem, Japan, US, and Europe. And in Japan, we have added added problem from, uh, from the disaster, okay? So that's the, that's the plan for the session, okay? And uh, I will try to give some uh, 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 introduction uh, and, and put, put some, some of my views, okay? Now, before going into more what we call macroeconomic uh, point of view, let me uh, make some uh, comments on uh, the sort of standard approach of uh, risk uh, and risk management. Okay, so this is the only slide what I, I will talk of risk management rather, uh, rather than disaster management, you know, before and after thing. Now, we usually think in economics that what, what um, we prepare for the rest is that whether we, it's worthwhile to do the countermeasure. Okay? And the standard approach is cost-benefit analysis. And uh, suppose there is some countermeasure, let's say tidal uh, barrier or something, uh, and we, we know how much it will cost to uh, build such a barrier, and um, uh, how e effective it, it would be, versus the probability of such a disaster coming, and the cost of damage, what would it have been? So think about, you know, before the disaster, did we, if we knew the probability, I think from session one, that you know, we, we have some sense that maybe we couldn't have calculated the probability of this uh, big earthquake coming, but suppose we knew the probability. Then just probability times what would have been the damage that we expected, and versus the cost of putting up the barrier or the, um, having the more effective uh, uh, tsunami evacuation uh, plan, then we can calculate so cost and benefits and uh, we derive whether it's worthwhile to put such a, such a plan or not. Okay? It's very um, uh, simple and abstract, but that's, that's the approach economists would take for the risk management. Now, now the disaster happened, and unfortunately, vast area has been flattened. What is this uh, risk management for the future would be? Well, we lost some of the uh, uh, some of the towns and and, and cities, but that's um, that changed the uh, calculation of this cost and benefit analysis. That we we. Uh, we lost some of the status quo so that we can plan anew. So building a town which is more resilient to natural disaster uh, would, be, would be possible. So that's, that's where res restoration versus reconstruction comes in. Is it worthwhile to restore what we used to have and maybe added barrier for, for the tsunami or should we build a new town somewhere some are higher grounds uh, and, and so on. So that's, that's a debate we have been doing this uh, whole year and we don't have, some, some, some towns decided to relocate higher grounds but they have trouble uh, uh, purchasing land for the higher grounds and some uh, towns cannot decide whether to restore or move. And the uh, central government is also not uh, sure that what, what, to, what to advise local government. Okay, so that's the uh, one, one aspect, difficult aspect that we, we have. Okay, what, one digression, this, this, this added, I, I added this um, uh, item uh, very late, uh, actually this morning. Now, uh, we know that, uh, it has been talked about in session one, that we had disaster in uh, Fukushima Daiichi. But Fukushima Daini, which is uh, close to Daiichi, was sort of saved because there was emergency uh, electricity line which was uh, 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 working. Two, two lost, but one line was working and they uh, kept pumping in the water. Onagawa, which is much closer to the epicenter, they were fine. Okay? So why Daiichi was 
such, uh, develop such a problem because they lost all the emergency power to pump the water in. Why they lost the emergency, uh, 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 emergency uh, uh, electricity? Because the emergency uh, uh, generator was on the seaside, coastline side of the reactor, uh, reactor building. Why the oil was lost? Because oil was on the exposed on the ocean side, not the inland side. Fukushima <coughs> Daini, those generator was in-house, in the reactor housing. So they, they, uh, they, they were, um, they, they suffered, but did not much complete damage. Onaga was on the high ground. So even the Daini, which was built later than Daiichi, had better design. <coughs> And so they didn't retrofit Daiichi for the genera generator's location and so on. How much cost it would have been to relocate those emergency generator to the mountain side, inland side, from the ocean side? It wouldn't have been much, right? So um, I don't know what's the probability distribution before the disaster of this 20 meter high uh, tsunami versus five meter, which was the uh, assumption. But the uh, um, uh, even if very small probability of this twenty meter tsunami, it would have been you know justified to relocate those gener uh, emergency generator and oil tank to the inland side. It's just don't say maximum is five five meter, but put the probability distribution to zero meter to 20 meters would have been enough to justify this relocation. So this is a sort of application of cost-benefit analysis. Okay, so now the rest of the talk is so-called macroeconomics, which is a uh, finance, financing cost for the government. Now, this, this is the uh, way we think about the disaster. Disaster, we lose assets, okay? So we, the tsunami destroyed towns, social infrastructure, social, social infrastructure, train tracks, airports, and so on. So big drop in the uh, stock of uh, national assets. So this is a big drop. So J Japan is now poorer, uh, poorer by some trillion uh, yen, then slowly go back to the original path, and hopefully we accumulate back what we lost. How to accumulate back? Well, we have to spend a lot. Okay? So this is a uh, economic growth rate. This is the stock of assets. This is a flow of production. So uh, economic growth rates uh, suddenly drops because we lose a, a productive capacity, but government spends more. So we will have the surge of economic growth uh, for some time because government spends it. And probably go back to normal. So this is the sort of the path of the flow and stock of national uh, economy, okay? So we, we, will, we will say that year, this year, 2012, and possibly 13, we will have higher economic growth rate. What it appears to be good economy, okay? Because the government will spend, surely spend to reconstruct uh, uh, the economy. But still, we are poorer uh, compared to before uh, 3.11, okay? Now, um, problem is government spends it, but how do they find money? That's the, that's the uh, financing, uh, financing uh, problem, okay? So how much this damage would, uh, was, okay? Uh, there, there are several estimates. Well, uh, unfortunately, we, we do not uh, have, we don't have uh, estimates for the human lives uh, uh, loss. We only count, or we means the government. Government only counts the physical damage of the uh, of the uh, tsunami, and airports and social infrastructure and so on, and the, uh, the housing factories and so on. They come up uh, with estimates of about 16 to 17 trillion yen which is about 3% of GDP, okay? So 3% of GDP worth of stock suddenly disappeared. 
that's the um, what we usually call the damage of the uh, earthquake and tsunami. The 16 to 17 trillion yen does not include the nuclear accident related losses, which is a contamination uh, and decontamination uh, costs and compensation to the house, houses lost in the house, the area you cannot uh, go in. Those nuclear related costs are not in the 16 to 17 trillion yen. How much would it would be an estimate of this nuclear related costs? Nobody knows. But I, I, I saw some estimates, which I have no idea what the, the basis is, is like 20 trillion yen. So double this uh, fiscal damage uh, because of this uh, nuclear related thing. Okay, so we have to pay for it as a society. Okay? So that's the question uh, 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 for this. And um, uh, on the flow, which means this, this part, um, how, uh, for, first go, goes down because the production chain was lost. One, one company in Sendai was producing 60%, 60% of so-called uh, small computer controlling the automobile engine. 60% global share. That's why after the earthquake, the, um, uh, there was a long, uh, 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 there's a big decline in auto production worldwide, not only Toyota, but the GM uh, and so on. Okay. Then uh, we, we, have, we will have increase in the investment because we have to uh, reconstruct uh, uh, those um, uh, towns and, and, and so on. Okay. So there, there's a big debate on what kind of re reconstruction should be. Some, some people, advocated to move higher grounds. Some people advocated to restore the original towns, but you know, putting up a big, big wall uh, on, on the coastline um, and, and so on. One aspect we have to be careful is that this is a region that was losing population. And um, uh, this, would continue, this would continue even if we didn't have the disaster. And because of the disaster that the already some people, especially with the young, young family, have moved out of the, of the region, will they come back if they restore the original town and cities? Uh, many people do not think so. We need to probably build new type of cities, the, uh, which, is, uh, which is more uh, friendly to elderly people and, and uh, less costly to maintain the communities. And um, uh, from here, it's my, my proposal, but it's, it's called compact city, which is to move the uh, people in the small area and provide the social services in this uh, uh, small area, which, which is probably near the, uh, near the uh, train station and medical care and, and long-term care would be provided easily. If it's uh, you know, dispersed in the large area, even just you know, sending a doctor uh, or coming to the hospital would be very costly and it would be very difficult to maintain those uh, uh, city in, in, in the um, uh, sparsely dis uh, populated uh, uh, area. So many economists have propose the, not all, but the many economists propose to have new kind of uh, cities, move the train track to inland, move the highways to inland, and create a compact city around the stations of the train track. This has not been uh, uniformly uh, 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 agreed, and some proposals still pushing, but uh, some people just want the old Towns back, old train track back, and there's a battle of the how to how to reconstruct. Now, uh, financing costs. Well, to 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 get the money for the reconstruction, there are only three ways to do it: uh, expenditure substitution. You you decrease university budget and and put the reconstruction money for that, uh, uh, or tax increase, uh, reconstruction tax. Or the um, issue of the government bonds, deficit financing. Okay, 
what the Japanese government has proposed, and I'm sure that it will go through the diet, is to issue the bonds first, but to make sure it will be paid back by future tax increase. Actually, income tax increase for 25 years. Okay? So the first issued bonds, but make sure that we pay back in 25 years by income tax increase. Okay? I have some problem with that. Okay? The reason is that the uh, demographic uh, dynamics. <coughs> okay, demography. That um, uh, in, in Japan, the uh, population is decreasing already. And the working age population is decreasing faster. So, um, this is 1950 uh, population, so called uh, population uh, pyramid. Okay. So 1950, when I was born, so I'm, I'm here at the bottom of the pyramid. Okay. Now, 30 years later, um, this is a baby boom uh, around age 30. And the, there is a second baby boom, which that we baby boomers produce offsprings in great numbers. So this is called second generation of baby boomers. This is now. Okay. We are 60 years old, and there's a big bulge uh, in 60 years old, and there are some uh, increase in age 40, and there's no third baby boomer. Okay. So um, it looks very strange pyramid. And this is 30 years later, and this is 60 years later. So it'll be very strange shape uh, uh, population dynamics that top heavy, which means that we'll be retired and we'll be receiving pension, but we will not be paying income tax. So 25 years later, no, you know, our generation will not be paying taxes to, for the reconstruction. So we will not be paying for the reconstruction. We want to pay. Baby boomers want to contribute for the reconstruction, but we are not allowed to. That's very strange, I think. Okay? So this is why third, third uh, baby boomer didn't happen. So uh, uh, Japanese women are, uh, refuse to uh, refuse the uh, proposal for men. Uh, and uh, elderly are very healthy. So they have long, long life, but no babies. Okay. So critical questions. Uh, reconstruction plan, what kind of towns and cities we construct. Funding, who's going to pay for it? By what me measures? And whether that will sustain debt, which is already high in Japan. Uh, Professor Shioji will talk about this. And relationship to US and Europe, that can we learn lessons from uh, US and Europe uh, on uh, how to control uh, expenditures. Okay, and um, uh, so uh, Professor Mori's presentation uh, goes for the funding issues, and uh, uh, Professor Shioji talks about debt sustainability, and US Europe, uh, uh, Professor Bailey uh, will talk about it. Thank you very much. to have invited me to this uh, very interesting session. Uh, but still, I'm a little bit you know, hesitant to talk in front of you, because I would represent the people who do not understand radiation. And uh, especially, I was not taught in the school what radiation is. <laughs> 
therefore, you know, that there are a lot of misunderstanding in my presentation, but uh, still, you know, that uh, conversation is a very important thing to, to do. Therefore, I will try my best, and uh, uh, somehow I'd like to contribute to the discussion. Yes, uh, almost one year has passed uh, since the Great East uh, Japan earthquake. At that time of earthquake, I was in Bangkok and uh, saw on the TV station, TV uh, television, that uh, foreign you know, that broadcasting station like BBC or CNL broadcasted the image of uh, the Fukushima or Sendai. The, uh, I couldn't believe that the image, those images, were really real. Uh, I hope that they were really only you know, the Hollywood movies, but unfortunately, of course, they are really real. Uh, Professor Ito uh, spoke about the wide range of uh, challenges Japan is now facing. Uh, the recovery from the disaster is, of course, an enormous challenge. However, I think that it is unnecessary to dramatize the situation. <coughs> Japan is a part of so-called Pacific Link of Fire. <coughs> the country is destined to experience earthquakes and tsunami. As long as you live there, you have to be prepared for such natural disasters at all times. As terrible as the earthquake and tsunami were, in comparison with the previous disasters, the amount of damage caused was not particularly large. Please look at this table. <coughs> this is 1923 Kanto Great Earthquake. My grandmother was at that time had a young baby. And uh, of course, he was, it was my father. And he, my grandmother always told about this you know, big earthquake which struck you know, the, the center of Tokyo. And at that time, the uh, damage was estimated to be about, about uh, approximately 30% of the GDP, which, or GNP, which Professor mentioned, you know, Ito mentioned. Hanshin Awaji Great Earthquake of 1995, it was about 2%. And 2011 East Japan Great Earthquake there is a still you know, that, a lot of uh, different you know, variation, but uh, approximately about three to five percent. So you can understand you know, that in comparison with this Kanto Great Earthquake, the number is more comparable to Hanshin Awaji Great Earthquake. So uh, as also Professor Ito mentioned that many research institutes predict that the Japanese economy will uh, experience positive growth this year due to the reconstruction work in the Tohoku area. And uh, maybe in the next year, we will have no more so such, you know, that uh, big, you know, construction work, reconstruction work, but still, you know, that we will maybe record, you know, that positive growth. Of course, there are many problems to be uh, solved in the, you know, that meantime. However, there is no reason to further dramatize uh, an already difficult situation. Uh, one critical aspect of this disaster is that this is the first time that Japan has experienced a serious, serious accident at the nuclear power plant. The incident has raised major questions concerning the future of Japanese energy policy. Providing satis satisfactory answers to those questions is one of the major challenges that Japan faces in the longer term. I will now discuss what I consider to be the three major challenges that we currently face. The first challenge is, that, as I mentioned, the national energy policy. The second is that the economic policy, uh, fiscal policy, and but particularly, I would like to mention here about the monetary policy. The third challenge is the country's education policy. As uh, Professor Ito mentioned that we have a dream, dream, uh, decreasing you know, that, the population, and the how to educate our young people is really a big challenge for us. 
Uh, I'm also very much concerned about this third point because I'm in charge of the internationalization of the Kyoto University and I'm really every day tackling with the problems how to educate our students internationally. Today, USGA invited many young students who are studying in Washington, D.C. or surrounding areas. So this is one of the you know, efforts that the Japanese universities are doing. Okay. Uh, nuclear energy. Uh, my question is uh, very uh, courageous in front of you. But the, is it necessary for the economic growth of Japan? The first challenge is formulating the uh, national energy policy of Japan. This is one of the most uh, challenging matters for a country. Uh, Japan relies very much on imported energy. 97% of it, its energy comes from abroad. This ratio is the highest among the OECD countries. Nuclear energy has been thought to be the most promising energy source for Japan. But the perception of nuclear energy among the population has changed drastically since the disaster. Even before the nuclear disaster, the government's nuclear energy policy was not fully accepted by the Japanese people, although Japan had continued to operate its nuclear reactors there was no appropriate place to dispose of the nuclear waste. After the earthquake, the Japanese lost confidence in the nuclear energy policy of Japan. Currently, all nuclear power plants in Japan, except for two, have stopped operations. The remaining two plants will stop operating in May to allow for regular inspections. Uh, most local authorities where the plants are located are reluctant to permit the reopening of the reactors. It may be that only a few new reactors will reopen very slowly. Realistically thinking, there is no chance that Japanese electricity companies will build any nuclear power plants. The question is that whether the Japanese economy can grow without nuclear power. My answer to that question is yes. There are several reasons why I believe so. Even in the last year, most of the existing nuclear power reactors in Japan have, have already stopped their operations. Uh, of course, uh, there are very much concerns. Uh, the electric, city com electric company and the Ministry of International Trade and Industry have issued warnings that there will be a shortage of electricity this coming summer. The Kansai Electric Power Company, which was relying mostly on nuclear power plants, will have difficulties supplying adequate power this summer. To address this problem last year, however, Japan increased its imports of fuel and LNG from abroad. The same method could be employed again this summer. Of course, uh, this is a rather short-term view of the problem. In the longer term, Japan needs to secure a more stable energy supply. After March 11, there are strong expectations that the renewable energy, particularly solar power stations, would solve the energy problems of Japan. But more realistic thinking has led us to understand that solar power will not be able to solve our problems in such a short period of time. In the meantime, natural gas will be a most reliable energy source for Japan. As an immediate, uh, immediate solution to our energy problems, natural gas has uh, two major advantages. The first is that more global natural gas resources have been found, which will enable a fairly stable supply of liquefied natural gas for a longer time. The second is its relative safety. One problem with nuclear energy is that the vulnerability of nuclear power plants to terrorist or missile attacks from countries such as North Korea. I will show uh, some pictures. This is a distribution of nuclear power plants in Japan. And uh, there are two areas where 
you know, the, the three areas. So, uh, the, uh, the dense dis distribution of nuclear power plants. This is Fukushima. And there are many power plants also in nuclear reactors in Niigata. And here we have a dense you know, that, uh, uh, distribution of uh, reactors in uh, Fukui Prefecture. And I will show this next picture. This is, you know, that uh, Fukui. Oops. Oh, yeah. There are, you know, a chain of uh, uh, reactors. This is a kind of corridor of nuclear pre uh, reactors. And the city where I live, Kyoto, is here. And we talked about the 50 miles, you know, this morning and lunchtime. And this is 80 kilo, so it's about 50 miles. So if there is any accident here, but in one of the, you know, these reactors, the total whole, you know, that the Kyoto citizens should be evacuated. Is it possible that we have 1.4 million people <coughs> in that city? And the, the local governments of Fukui or Kyoto or Shiga prefecture, they are very much concerned about this situation. And can you imagine that they will you know, simply permit that it's okay that we will uh, run these reactors? So in the longer term, Oh yeah, and, oh yeah, another slide. I'm really, personally, you know, that, uh, very concerned. Because that North Korea is our, you know, neighboring country. And how many kilo we have, you know, between North Korea and Japan. And I really don't know what kind of impact that, uh, for example, some missiles from North Korea would have and on now in uh, the nuclear power plants. So the risk is really not easy to measure. The, in the longer term, the Japan and the world as a whole needs new energy resources. Uh, last year, when uh, President Hiroshi Matsumoto of Kyoto University gave a lecture for the USGI here in Washington, he spoke about the potential of solar power satellites According to some estimates, one solar power satellite costs less than one trillion yen, or US dollar twelve billion dollars. In comparison with the enormous costs incurred by accident at nuclear power plants, such investment in solar power satellite is not unrealistic. Okay, and I will go to the next topic: the Bank of Japan's monetary policy and national government bonds. The Professor Ito mentioned the financing of the recovery cost for the earthquake and tsunami disaster. Should the recovery be financed by taxes or by national debt? Uh, the Professor Ito suggested that we should finance the recovery with tax you know, immediately, not to prolong for 25 years. I quite agree uh, to finance the recovery cost with uh, tax and a short term, you know, that we can pay. But it is not only the recovery cost, but also the cost of social welfare, the whole cost of the Japanese government, which should be financed with consumption tax or other, you know, taxes. This is, a, you know, that graph that uh, how the accumulated debt of the national government. The, we have currently about uh, more than 900, you know, trillion. Uh, yen, the, the uh, debt, the cost of the, you know, that recovery could be about 30 trillion. It's a very tiny part of our, you know, the total accumulation of debt. So anyway, there is no other choice that uh, we have to, you know, raise the uh, tax. The, I'd like to talk a little bit about the EOJ's monetary policy. The uh, VOJ's conservative policy has caused uh, many problems, I think, in the past, and may not be, uh, may need to be reviewed more critically. We spoke 10 years ago about the lost decade, and now we are talking about the two lost decades. 
namely 1990s and 2000s. I believe that one cause of those two lost decades is a Bank of Japan's ultra-conservative monetary policy. For the last two decades, Japan has suffered from deflation. Even today, Japan, Japan continues to suffer from deflation. When you look at this graph, oh, uh, there is a you know that uh, consistent you know that okay there is a some hike here but otherwise there is a consistent you know that uh, uh, deflation you know that continuing in Japan. The in under such you know, circumstances, it is very difficult for any entity, either you know uh, government or corporations or individuals who have a uh, debt, it is very difficult to get out of debt. That's really reality. Uh, the, there are aspects of Japanese economy which are not easy to understand. The first is that uh, until recently, the Japanese yen had been considered a safe haven among world currencies, and it has been or it had been bought in the foreign exchange market since 2007. In 2007, one was traded at 124 yen, and now one is being traded at around 80 yen. Why was the Japanese yen considered a safe haven, even though the Japan has various problems in it, with it? Uh, even after the Great East Japan earthquake or the Fukushima nuclear accident, the yen continued to be bought until the beginning of this February. The, in Japan, deflationary pressure is still prevailing, as ha you have seen in the graph. The, I would say that the only reason that Japanese yen is a safe haven is that the supply is not adequate compared to other currencies. Last month, the VOJ changed its policy. On February 14th, the VOJ issued a statement on the enhancement of monetary easing. According to the statement, the price stability goal in the medium to long term is to be within a positive range of 2% or lower in terms of the year-on-year -year rate of change in the CPI, and it sets a goal at 1% for the first time uh, for the time being. This policy represents a change, of course, and it has already had a positive impact on the market and the value of the yen against other major currencies. Uh, recently, the yen dropped from 78 yen to 1 US dollar to 82 yen to 1 US dollar. And also the Japanese stock market has recovered very dramatically, remarkably. So Japan has suffered a great deal from deflation during the last two decades. As I just mentioned, the BOJ's ultra-conservative policy was one of the major causes of the problem. And I hope that BOJ will keep its current stance for the long, uh, longer term and not change its policies in an effort to combat inflation, which is not existing right now. The investment in the future. The, uh, the monetary policy, of course, was not the only cause of the stagnation of the Jap Japanese economy in the last two decades. A more important cause was the lack of innovation in Japan. Japan was so uh, successful in the 1970s and uh, by the middle of the 1980s, uh, Japanese corporations believed that they could conquer the whole global market. The reality, however, was that the uh, many Japanese corporations stuck to their traditional strengths and could not build up a business model utilizing emerging technologies like IT. The globalization process demands great challenges in every country's social system. Uh, one indication of Japan's uh, increasing awareness of globalization is a frequent appearance in the media of the rec recently coined Japanese term global jinzai or global human resources. A uh, major reason for the growing awareness of the importance of uh, GHR is Japan's, uh, Japanese industry's increasing shift in focus towards international markets uh, Japanese corporations are putting a great deal of effort into recruiting talented international employees. The Japanese government is, has put a policy in order to you know, that, uh, 
uh, respond to that. You know that we are the government uh, uh, applied that new policy to increase the number of international students in the Japanese university. You know uh, about 2.5 times in 10 years to 300,000. And in this year, the Japanese government also is trying to implement a new policy to increase the number of the Japanese students studying outside Japan uh, to uh, also increase to 300,000. Uh, it's about you know that five or six times higher than the current numbers. Okay, that's all what I would like to talk, and thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> from Hitotsubashi University. And you may be wondering why Hitotsubashi, what the Hitotsubashi guy is doing here when the, the university is not included in the consortium. Um, I hope you can see it. I, it's, it's a small letter. I intentionally made it small, but uh, I also happen to be a part-time lecturer at the University of Tokyo, and probably that was the reason why I was invited. So um, let me erase that logo for the moment. And for the next 20 minutes, I'm going to pretend that I'm a part of the <laughs> okay. Um, okay, he's back, so. Okay, um, I'm, I'm sure I'm really running out of time, so let me just say that uh, the conclusion first, uh, which is the tax aspect. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Okay. Um, so next, I'm going to use the next one minute to review the Go overview the, the performance of the Japanese economy and then spend most of the time talking about six major challenges that the Japanese economy faces right now. Six. Um, okay, so overview, I think it's easier to just see the graph. So I prepared the GDP graph, but <coughs> let me just focus on industrial production, uh, which is uh, easier to see. Um, Japan is red, and I put other countries like uh, Germany, US, and Korea uh, up there uh, for comparison, okay? Um, so that's uh, the Lehman crisis, and Japan was very slow in recovering from the crisis, and as we thought that the finally the Japanese economy was coming out of the recession, uh, so this is the earthquake. Um, then yes, of course, uh, so part of the reason for the loss was because of this uh, destruction of the supply chain and everything. And the Japanese firms did a great job in recovering from that uh, to some extent. But you can also see that the recovery hasn't been as strong as uh, the previous destruction. And uh, also, uh, Japan has not went, gone back to the previous uh, path of uh, fast economic growth. Um, even after the, the earthquake period. So that's a very brief summary. And let me talk about the six major challenges one by one. The first is the fiscal sustainability. We've been talking about it already. Um, and I'm sure many of you have seen those numbers, like uh, uh, debt to GDP ratio of Japan is like over 200%. Um, so, that makes us wonder why people are so worried about Greece when, uh, <laughs> and uh, we hope that it, it will stay that way and people don't notice it. But so we, we shouldn't be talking about it here. Um, so a popular research topic right now is, to, is predicting the X day, uh, X day meaning that the day when the, the Japanese fiscal situation becomes unsustainable, people stop buying Japanese government bonds, JGBs. The really scary part is that it's all up to what people expect. So imagine that those researchers were right, and imagine that the Japanese budget will, will become um, unsustainable in, say, year 
2015. If we are sure that the budget becomes unsustainable in 2015, we should stop buying JGBs now, which means that if people really think that way, uh, the budget becomes unsustainable, not really in 2015, but right now, uh, today, okay? Uh, I think the market's still open. So, um, <laughs> so it's all up to expectation. So that's a scary part. So it's all up to what the market, market participants think about, uh, about the situation of the Japanese budget. So for me, um, it is not enough that for the moment, people are still buying the JGBs. Um, I think it's very dangerous. It, the situation is already dangerous in the sense that our fate is all up to what the market participants are thinking about. And as soon as they change their minds, we're in big trouble. And that's already a very dangerous situation. We have to correct for that. So um, we really need a workable plan right now, hopefully, because some things can happen even today, um, to convince the market that the, gov the Japanese government is very serious about, and it has a plan, feasible plan, to ba balance the budget in the future. Maybe not now, but the, the government should be able to draw a time path for, the, for balancing the budget in the future. Okay? So, so that's the, the first important thing. And uh, for that, I think, practically speaking, tax increases, um, especially in the form of consumption tax, is inevitable. Um, on the other hand, you know, the important thing is to convince the market and show the plan. Okay? So in a sense, if the market is convinced, uh, we don't have to do it now. Okay. So um, Actually, it may not be a great idea to start raising taxes like this year, or maybe even, not even next year, because we have a very big short-run concern, which I will talk about next, which is the energy problem. Um, we've already discussed that Japan, until last year, relied 24% of electricity from nuclear sources, and it's going to come down to zero in May. Um, so that poses a big short-term risk. Um, here, I, I think I disagree with that, Professor Mori, but uh, I don't think a large economy like Japan can take such a big uh, short-term adjustment. Okay? Um, nuclear reactor, we, our perception about the nuclear uh, plants have changed, but that doesn't mean that the plants suddenly became, have become more dangerous. Okay? So, um, <coughs> And if we really stop the electricity supply by cut, cutting it by uh, a quarter, uh, that might accelerate firms moving, off, uh, moving their operations to uh, Southeast Asia and all, the, all those other countries. So um, for me, the main problem concerning nuclear plants is not so much about uh, how many of them are there, but uh, many of them are getting really, really old. Okay? And uh, like the Fukushima Daiichi, the, the, the number of Fukushima was a really old plant. And uh, I'm a little bit concerned that if we stop building new, new plants now, uh, there's a lot of economic pressure to, to prolong the, the life of those already old plants. And that could be even more dangerous. So I think in the short term, it's kind of acceptable that we, we could even promote or accelerate construction of new plants so that we can retire those old plants without causing too much economic difficulties. And also, we will probably have to raise the electricity prices, not because we want the tech call to survive in the market, but we, we have realized that the true cost of generating electricity is much higher than we are told to, to believe. Right? So we should raise the prices in such a way that they will reflect those two costs of energy. And by doing that, that might actually encourage development of alternative uh, energy sources such as solar power. And that's, the, that's probably one of the ideal uh, scenarios that could happen in the near future. Uh, radiation of food safety is another big concern. Um, so the current... Japanese, the, the current policy of the Japanese government is basically a 
the random sampling. So agricultural products from designated areas have to go through random sampling. So they, they just pick up several uh, cabbages and uh, they just test. Okay? Um, but frankly speaking, they have failed to restore the confidence of the consumers. And what they're, what they're doing, what much of the media is doing right now is to blame the consumers for being irrational and uh, too, too, too conservative. But blaming the consumers doesn't really resolve the situation because, you know, they're worried. And uh, if you just tell them you're being unscientific, don't worry. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't solve the situation. So we have to take, kind of take it as a given that they're concerned. And uh, their, their concern, I think, is so, sort of justified because as, co as a consumer myself, I usually think mostly about the, the worst case scenarios, um, which is that, OK, most of those cabbages are probably OK because it went through the test. But uh, maybe this cabbage, this particular cabbage didn't go through the test. Or maybe some people tried to um, mislabel the, the, the origin of the cabbage. Um, so I think, I think it was also in Professor Ito's proposal, but um, I think we really have to go for a tougher regulation and uh, like a testing all the, the cabbages that come from the area. And at the same time, if that causes uh, financial trouble to the, those farmers, we have to be generous and compensate for the losses because they didn't cause a problem. But that means even more money is needed for the government in the near future. About the reconstruction of the, the disaster areas, um, Professor Ito also talked about, especially this idea of the compact city uh, to consolidate several local towns and villages at, and at higher places. And, uh, and the, the main motivation behind this idea is that the society is aging. And if all those elderly are scattered all over the places, it's going to be very difficult to take care of all of them. So it is better to consolidate those uh, smaller communities into a bigger community. Actually, this proposal has been, um, we economists uh, are <coughs> divided on this idea. Um, there are many people among economists who, who basically take the same approach to many of those things, um, say that it's too costly, um, and also it tends to destroy the existing co could destroy the existing communities because you know those communities turned out to be really really valuable right after the earthquake because those you saw that those people are really helping each other and encouraging each other, so um, that might be lost. Uh, when we try to relocate those people into different places. Um, and the reality is that it's worse than those people who have this second view had proposed. Uh, we are having difficulty even to move the existing small communities slightly in that. So we, we are not even talking about consolidating, just moving the, the same community a little bit in that and cost of, causes a lot of trouble. So I think my own assessment is that compact city is a good idea, and uh, I think it is worth the cost. But it also means another, there's another reason for the government expect to have to pay for those costs. So more and more money, reason for the, the Japanese government uh, to increase spending. Um, deflation, zero interest rate, um, I don't have much time to talk about it. Um, I, I'll just say that deflation is a, a persistent deflation is a very difficult thing to deal with. Um, so um, here's a, the Japanese interest rate and the CPI inflation rate, and uh, obviously it's it's come down a lot. Um, we have the deflation, therefore the the central bank lowers the interest rate, but in a low interest rate environment, it is very difficult for the people to have a big uh, expectation for the future inflation. So those two kind of, kind of reinforces each other. So it's very difficult uh, to get out of the situation once we're in this situation. And for me, 
the only workable solution is to, to expand the, the government spending. And uh, so use the government spending as a stimulus. And that also means even more reason for the, the Japanese government uh, to spend money. And uh, we have already seen that what kind of budget situation the Japanese government is in right now. So far, OK, I'm already on this, the last. So lastly, about more long-run issues that the Japanese economy faces. Um, so it's about the demography and the productivity. As I seem to have some time, um, here is uh, the population of Japan. It's, the history is up to here. So that's from the Yedo period. So it's a very long history. And uh, we are about here. And in 100 years, we'll be down there. So the population will be uh, the same as around the, the Meiji period. And if it's just a small population, it doesn't matter so much. We know many, country, many great countries uh, with relatively small populations of this size or even smaller. So the, the smaller population itself it's not a big economic problem. It's a big political problem, a military problem. Um, on the other hand, uh, we're expecting the share of a 65 and over to be uh, we are now around here. It's going to go up to 40% very quickly. So this is an unprecedented aging of the entire society. OK, um, but. Even if population is decreasing, um, as long as we are a strong nation and we can produce in per capita basis a lot of output, meaning that if we remain productive, each, if each Japanese person can produce more output, uh, that wouldn't be so much of a problem. I think the real problem is that that's not happening. So this is real GDP. So this is how much an average person in that society is producing in each year. And we are normalizing everybody so that the US level is equal to 100 years so, so this is the United States. And Japan was obviously um, catching up very quickly. But during the last decade, um, we, had, we lost some ground. And in, in the meantime, um, Singapore and uh, Hong Kong surpassed Japan. Uh, this is all adjusted for differences in the price levels. And Korea is coming from behind very quickly. So um, some people say that we, we don't really need economic growth anymore. We're rich enough. But uh, I think most Japanese people, especially young people, won't be able to take this uh, situation to last. So we really need a productivity growth. Um, and the reason why we're missing productivity growth, in my view, is that we have a relatively old industrial structure uh, skewed towards manufacturing. And so we really need an inter allocation of resources to shift, shifting towards uh, more uh, promising areas. <coughs> and here I put the example of office workers versus nurses. So this is um, vacancy to job seekers ratio. So basically it means that there are a lot of people who, be, who want to become office workers, but there isn't so much demand. Whereas there are so many people who want to be nurses, but the nurses are really needed desperately in Japan. Okay? So this shows some kind of a mismatch of resources. And, you know, the, the needs and the supply are mismatched in Japan. And uh, why is it happening? In my view, this is because m many of those areas are, uh, you know, have a strong, strong, or under strong regulation by the government. The public sector's presence is very important. So um, although the current elderly in Japan, uh, or the near future, um, they will be receiving relatively generous pensions that our generation can't imagine. Uh, but they are living in a kind of anxiety. Um, if you know that. Uh, well, as long as you're healthy, you're OK. But if you get sick, um, there are not many nurses to take care of you. Um, how can you live in a life with a good quality? So I think that 
public spending is really needed, not, not so much for this short-term reason, but uh, to change the, the feature of the Japanese economy in the long run. So to conclude, um, I've, I think I've added so many reasons why the Japanese government has to spend more than less. Um, so basically, future tax hikes, especially in consumption taxes, is inevitable. Um, but that has to happen after we somehow resolve this short-run issue of what to do with the existing nuclear plants. Uh, fiscal policy is important as a short-run measure. And uh, like it or not, for reconstruction and decontamination of food safety issues, um, the government has to increase spending um, anyway. And I emphasize at the end that fiscal policy is important for long-run structural uh, adjustments. So that instead of public investment or transfer payments, uh, we, we, could spend, we may have to spend more money on government consumption. So maybe we cannot promise so much of a pension money to the future elderly, but maybe uh, if we do it wisely, we could promise a better quality of life at a lower cost. So as a conclusion, I said tax, tax and spend, but that means like uh, tax and spend are about the same amount, but that's not true. That cannot happen. So I, here I said uh, tax, tax, and uh, hopefully spend a little bit more than we, uh, right now. So tax hikes are needed. Um, but raising taxes just to restore long-run fiscal balance is not likely to be enough. And we, have to, we may have to go a little bit further. for inviting me to talk. It's a pleasure. Um, the United States, as you know, suffers uh, frequent uh, disasters in the form of hurricanes and earthquakes and stuff like that. Um, but uh, at least so far, we haven't had a, a natural disaster that's registered all that large on the scale of the national economy. Um, even uh, New Orleans, uh, which was uh, bad enough, uh, really is barely noticeable in the, in the aggregate data. So in the absence of a natural crisis, uh, a natural disaster, we created a, a unnatural disaster um, and uh, spread it a good bit around the world. And so I'm going to talk about uh, how that, uh, how the U.S. economy is evolving, um, a little bit about did we do the right things in response to that crisis, and uh, how we're going to get out of it uh, in the end. Well, as you can see, our unnatural crisis, um, which was the financial crisis, I'm not going to talk really much about the origins of the financial crisis. I have written about that, and I encourage anyone who wants to, to check out the Brookings website, where we have quite a lot of written material on that. I'm going to talk about the aftermath of the recession that really has followed that, and the recovery, um, and at times, uh, slow recovery uh, from that recession. As you can see, uh, we had very, uh, Really, the end of 2008 and the beginning of 2009 was a, a scarier time as I've ever seen in, uh, in the economy. And the fact that it was happening globally as well made it even more scary. So what was the response of the uh, US government? Well, starting with the um, Bush administration, they in introduced the TARP, the so-called TARP, to try to uh, stabilize the banks. And then when the Obama administration came in, uh, they continued that, got the funding for that, and they supplemented it with a very sizable fiscal stimulus. Some people think it wasn't large enough, some people think it was way too large. Uh, they were both about the same size, the top and the stimulus, about 800 billion or so. Uh, did they work? Um, well, I think the answer is probably yes. We don't know what the counterfactual is. We don't know what would have happened without those policies. Uh, but I think it's quite likely that we would have seen a much worse uh, fisc uh, meltdown in the financial sector. 
um, after Lehman went down, which was a decision to uh, let it fail, um, it really the, there was an unraveling in the financial community, there was an unraveling in the stock market and in global markets, uh, really into bank lending on a lot of transactions, including trade transactions, just froze up after that. And so we got a sense that uh, letting the financial sector fail was really not an option. And so I think a lot of credit goes to um, uh, Tim Geithner and the team that, that uh, decided to do the uh, stress tests on the banks to find out how much capital they needed and to make it clear that the capital was available and could be used and could be deployed. I think we also give some credit to the fiscal stimulus. It was not a pretty plan. Um, it, 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 the decision was to do it quickly and so they allowed sort of Congress to do it on their own, which meant sort of all the congressmen and women and senators all wanted to have their piece of the action. So we had a very uncoordinated, rather discombobulated kind of stimulus. But as you can see from this chart, we went from a, a, a growth rate at an annual uh, rate for, the, for that quarter of nearly 9% uh, negative up to uh, positive growth rates of uh, more than 3% for, for a number of quarters. And the banking system, the financial sector, did actually stabilize. Okay, things sort of got worse from there. We thought, ah, oh, we, we've, uh, we've turned this thing around. Uh, we've gotten everything back on track, and it's now just a matter of a few quarters until we get going. By the way, I, I meant to say before I said what I just said, that I think that there are, should be a lot of people in Japan who told you, who say, I told you so. Because I can't tell you how many people from Japan came through my office in uh, 2004, 2005, 2006, warning that the U.S. had an unsustainable uh, real estate boom and that they had, uh, you, Japan, had gone through that in the 1980s and uh, you knew what it was like and uh, that they could cause a prolonged period of slow growth the last decade. Um, so if it's any consolation, you were right. And uh, I didn't pay attention, and most of us didn't pay attention, um, and try to forestall this from, uh, from happening, so it happened. Okay, fast forward down a little bit. Um, the growth that we thought we'd gotten off the ground started to stall out, you can see, and um, the end of 2010, the beginning of uh, 2011, all of a sudden the so-called green shoots of, of growth turned into uh, withered stalks, and it seemed as if we might drift back into uh, recession again. Okay, now we have not done so. Um, so growth in the second half of 2011 was a little bit stronger than the weakness in the first half of 2011 not what you'd call a really robust recovery. If you go back to 1982, when there was a deep recession, the recovery from that was much stronger. If you go back to 1975, when there was a deep recession, the recovery there was much stronger. But this recession was different, um, and we didn't get this kind of solid bounce back that we had had in previous uh, recessions. Okay. Now the outlook now, this is in red, uh, this is a macroeconomic advisor's forecast, they're a very good forecasting to, uh, firm. They have been a little optimistic uh, about the US economy in recent years, so this is not gospel, no forecaster has been uh, done very well uh, uh, in predicting this period. But it looks as if uh, growth is now getting a little bit stronger, so if we avoid trouble in 2000, 12 and continue in 2013, we should be doing better, but that remains uh, to be seen. So why is the economy recovering now? Um, well, consumers are spending again. Um, residential construction is growing again. We have not had a cyclical recovery in the period since 1945 that was not fueled in part by uh, residential construction. Um, and residential construction, as I'll show in a minute, had been dead in the water and is now beginning to come back. Business investment has been okay, and net exports have not been a drag on growth, and that's a big issue for the U.S. since net exports have been a problem in the house for some time. So we are recovering. Why was it so weak? Why didn't we have a, a, a kind of recovery like the kind we had in the 1980s? Um, well, because of the continued weakness in the labor market, 
the huge loss of household wealth and the overhang of mortgage foreclosures and underwater mortgages. And we've also seen a decline in government spending, uh, particularly at the state and local level. So the contribution of government to demand has been negative. Uh, there's been pretty aggressive monetary policy. Um, there were remarks a minute ago about the, the Bank of Japan. Um, the U.S. Fed has, uh, after a little hesitation in the early stages of the crisis, I think they've pretty much been on full throttle in terms of trying to stimulate the economy. They kept the interest rate, uh, the federal funds rate, close to zero, and they've done uh, quantitative easing, which is to say they ballooned, allowed their own balance sheet to balloon. Uh, we have a lot of excess monetary base out there uh, as they try to keep not only short-term rates, but even longer-term uh, uh, treasury rates uh, low. Uh, a lot of people uh, in this town and in the, at the University of Chicago are worried about what this will do to inflation down the road, um, but uh, uh, I'll have more to say about that in a minute. Thus far, I don't think inflation is a big problem here. Now, this just illustrates what a catastrophic decline in employment. We had a big decline in, in GDP, but the decline in, in employment was really much larger, and much larger than any recession we've had in the post-war period. Now, we did have a double dip recession in the 1980s, so maybe there's a couple of bumps there that we should add together, but even if you added them together, they wouldn't come anything close to what we had here. So the loss in employment appears to be not only that it was a severe recession, but that uh, business reacted to this recession by laying off everybody as fast as they could. So there was also an unusual reaction uh, to the recession. And productivity rose in this recession, which it doesn't normally do, as employment actually fell faster uh, than output. So we've got a long ways to go to get back to even the uh, level of employment we achieved uh, in December of uh, 2007. Uh, we had another 200 and some jobs uh, this um, announced uh, today, uh, which is not on this chart, but even so, uh, we still have a long way to go. As even assuming we get that 200, 250,000 jobs a month, it's going to take uh, several years, four, five, six years, to get back to a reasonable uh, level of unemployment. So in a sense, the United States is experience a lot, it, experiencing a lost decade as a result of this crisis. So again, you guys were right about that. Now, I mentioned that one of the reasons that consumers aren't consuming as fast as they used to is because we suffered this huge loss of wealth. It was actually worse, though it, it, it's come back a little bit. It's an only a $7.4 trillion loss uh, now. Of course, most of that loss is associated with housing. Housing prices have fallen, uh, I think now, a little more than 30%, and they haven't come back really at all at the national level. In some uh, metropolitan areas, they are starting to rise, including this one uh, in Washington, but, but nationally, housing prices are still declining uh, a little bit. So the comeback in wealth has mostly been the recovery in the stock market. Uh, most um, middle class families in the United States, their net worth, their net wealth is very concentrated in their house uh, or sometimes uh, their houses. Uh, and so this has been a real, uh, a real blow. There is some economic theory that says this kind of loss of housing wealth should not affect consumption, but I think that's baloney. Uh, I think it has affected uh, consumption. And if for no other reason, um, it's affected the ability of houses to um, uh, borrow and, and uh, manage their credit. Uh, so that you can't really borrow against housing wealth anymore if you, if you don't have that wealth to uh, borrow against. Uh, so one of the reactions that households have has has been that the savings rate uh, jumped. Now, it jumped pretty much from a standing start, so the saving rate in the United States has been very low. This is the household saving rate. National saving, and excuse me, private saving is a little better because uh, corporations in the U.S. have done a lot of saving and have a lot of uh, cash on hand, so the overall savings rate is not as low as this. Um, but government is uh, a dissaver, and households uh, in the United States have not been uh, positive savers, but there was a big jump up as a result of this uh, loss of wealth and of this recession. So because uh, households uh, felt uh, concerned about their jobs and uh, the safety of, of their employment income because they had lost wealth, uh, they cut back on consumption. 
um, and uh, still didn't get to a huge uh, high saving rate. But it was uh, not a great moment for them to do that, really. Um, it's sort of uh, one of those strange paradoxes. You know, we got into this whole financial mess because we were borrowing too much. Um, but on the other hand, once the recession hit, you really didn't want people to start saving a whole lot because you, you wanted to try to maintain consumption to keep uh, demand growing, otherwise you were going to go into a, a deeper recession. Now, in the last year, actually, the savings rate has not gone up. It's actually drifted down a little bit. So right now, you'd say that households are pretty much, consumption is growing at about the same rate as disposable uh, income. Households are spending what they get. So if we want households to spend more, they have to get more income. We have to break this vicious cycle of low employment, low income, uh, low spending. Now I mentioned, I'm not going to spend long on this, but I mentioned briefly that for the US, uh, trade deficits have been a bugaboo. We've had them for years and years and years. Um, they get better and get, and get worse. Uh, I think there is a concern uh, that with Europe now possibly going into recession, the Japanese economy may be not as strong as we would uh, like to see, um, that, uh, and even China slowing down to some degree, uh, that it will be hard for the U.S. to avoid an expanding trade deficit. And a trade deficit is a net reduction in total demand in the U.S. It means we are importing more than we are exporting. Consequently, there's not as much domestic uh, demand. And so we, we had a huge trade deficit going into this recession. It came down sharply as a result of the recession because uh, imports slumped more than exports. Imports are the red line above, uh, up above or orange line as it, as it uh, appears there. Um, so imports slumped more than exports and our trade deficit fell, so that actually helped us, as, a, as the US economy, helped us to ride out this recession a little bit. Uh, but now there's a concern that even though exports are growing pretty well, uh, imports are, are maybe growing a little faster, and that may uh, cause the, the recovery to, to be slow. Uh, I should have moved this chart earlier, but this is the housing starts, and I mentioned the weakness on, that, on the housing side. Um, so this shows uh, housing, and you can see it's very volatile, uh, very, uh, very much part of the business cycle in the U.S. Uh, and you'll notice that while we did have a, a big housing boom, um, it wasn't actually a steeper boom than we've had in earlier periods in the 1970s and so on. Um, it, it, but but uh, one of the things that's, that's true now is that the population growth rate is slowing, the number of new household formation is, is slowing, um, and uh, so we, we really, uh, the, the trend rate, growth rate of housing is a little bit slower, but we are just way below it. So we built too many houses and uh, the prices went too high and now we're sort of paying the price. Residential construction, you can hardly see it on this chart, but it is beginning to creep up, uh, and that's contributing positively, but we really still are in a housing uh, kind of doldrums. Um, <clears throat> now, I mentioned about monetary policy, and uh, uh, in my view, monetary policy correctly has been doing pretty much everything it can to try to get us back to uh, recovery, to uh, recover from this self-made uh, disaster. Uh, there are folks that feel that the Fed is doing too much and that we're going to get a period of hyperinflation as a result of what the Fed has done. And you can see that the inflation rate, this is on a year-over-year -year basis, has gone up a little bit and it's gone a little bit above the Fed's target of 1% to, to 2%. Uh, again, I'm not that concerned about this. I think this is, this is uh, excluding food and energy, so it does not directly take into account the, the rise in oil prices, but still the rise in those commodity prices do enter uh, other prices. So I think a lot of this is more from the commodity side. I don't think we have excess demand uh, yet in the U.S. economy. And in fact, if you look at um, it, the uh, expected rate of inflation that you can infer from looking at the so-called TIPS, which is the uh, uh, inflation-adjusted uh, Treasury bills, uh, TIPS had a very weird period in 2008-2009, in so I don't pay too much attention to that sudden dive. The market became a, a little crazy at that moment. But if you look at where we've been in the last few years, um, it, the expected inflation in, uh, in the U.S. at the moment 
uh, is sort of around the two, two and a quarter percent as, as uh, estimated from TIPS, and that seems entirely uh, reasonable and not something we should worry about. Now, something we should worry about and something that is clearly constraining uh, policy response to this crisis is the fiscal situation. So the U.S. has been running chronic uh, fiscal deficits. We ran them in the Reagan years uh, as Reagan cut taxes. Uh, we then uh, restored fiscal sanity in the Clinton years, and I uh, can't help pointing out that that little positive bump was uh, when I was in the administration. <laughs> I was not personally responsible for that, but I certainly uh, endorsed it. We actually had a substantial fiscal surplus in uh, 2000. Uh, the Bush administration, in my judgment, squandered that legacy of a fiscal surplus by uh, slashing taxes way more than uh, was really called for, not to mention fighting a couple of wars without really uh, levying any taxes to pay for them. So we went into this crisis in not very good fiscal shape. And uh, that was one of the reasons we did uh, only an $800 billion stimulus package, because with the existing deficits, it was hard uh, to contemplate doing a bigger one. Now, as you can see, the, the deficit just went way out of control as a result of the fiscal stimulus, that was part of it, but also because tax revenues plummeted and um, spending on things like unemployment insurance uh, soared as a result of the recession itself. So that big dive uh, into the blue um, is really more as a result of the recession, but it's partly also the stimulus package. So the question is, uh, what do we do now? I don't think we should try to balance the budget right now. The economy is still too weak. I think we want to get the recovery going, and that means we st still should be oriented towards keeping demand going. But obviously, over the longer run, we've got to do something. Now, the blue part is actually the CBO baseline, and that looks actually quite promising. It looks like we're going to shoot back towards uh, balance, even if we don't actually get there. Um, but that so-called baseline um, really says without uh, under existing law, and what that means is the Bush tax cuts would expire at the end of 2012. And a lot of other things like the, um, the alternative minimum tax and stuff like that. So actually, the blue line uh, shows what would happen if we don't have any new big spending programs and if we raise taxes quite substantially relative to where we are now. If you explore what many people think of as more realistic policies or what we're likely to do unless we um, come to our senses here, we're going to continue to have very large uh, deficits. And the very large deficits are because we did uh, seriously, did serious damage to our revenue base, uh, as a result of the, um, of the taxes. Okay, I'll, I'll finish up uh, more or less in line with everyone else. I'll run a couple of minutes over. Um, so the, the problem we have is we're not raising enough taxes in the long run. I wouldn't raise taxes now, but I would going forward. Um, and the idea that you can just tax the rich and do this, I don't think is realistic. I think everybody has to pay more taxes. We either have to have a value-added tax or go back to higher income taxes in order to balance the budget. But on the spending side, the notion that we're going to control spending uh, has this big blue line uh, standing in the way. Healthcare spending, and, and that's Medicare and Medicaid. Medicaid is quite large because it includes all the elderly who are in retirement uh, communities, retirement homes. Um, not, not the private ones, but the ones that are funded by, um, uh, by Medicaid. Uh, that number is, is just going to go up and up and up. And so we can't really solve our long-run problem without doing something to control uh, health care spending. And, and uh, you know, we are not having the right debate about this. Um, you know, uh, the, the Republicans, Romney says, we've got to control entitlements. And then he blames Obama for cutting Medicare. Well, what does he think the entitlements are? I mean, they're coming from outer space or something. That's what the entitlements are. Social Security, which is actually not in that bad shape, and Medicare and Medicaid, which are in, in a very precarious situation unless we can uh, control costs. And we are having the right debate. There was a, a, a poll recently that showed that 80% of Americans believe there should be no cuts in Medicare. Okay, that's fine, but do you want to raise taxes up to, do you want to double uh, federal taxes? because that's really the alternative and, and the thing that we're not, that we're not take, facing up to. 
Financial reform was something else we did in response to this crisis, but I've run out of time, so I'm going to uh, skip that. I think I've said pretty much uh, uh, everything that's on this page, except for the fact that I think the U.S. I, I share the optimism about the U.S. recovery with two main caveats. One is if oil prices jump because something happens in Iran and we get $200 a barrel oil, then I think it's going to be really hard. Uh, I think the U.S. would go into another recession. We'd certainly get another global recession. Uh, Europe seems to be uh, surviving, muddling along, muddling through at this point. Uh, good for them, um, but if that crisis really blows up, it would be hard for the U.S. to avoid. Uh, we are too entangled with Europe uh, to avoid that. Uh, this, I think I, I've said most of what's already uh, on here. Uh, I don't think we're going to solve the, the budget problems now, although in principle there are some solutions now that are out there if we could if we could actually get politicians who are courageous enough to talk about them. And I don't want to be too critical of Obama because he has made cuts in Medicare and uh, has done courageous things on health care. Uh, but we do have to grasp that nettle more firmly and, and, and deal with that uh, difficulty. Um, to, to any of you who are America watchers, uh, it's going to be interesting. Obviously, the election's going to be interesting. But then in the December, January period, unless they do something that surprises me before that, they're going to have a whole set of appropriations due. We're going to run into another debt limit crisis, so you know what the last one was like. The Bush tax cuts are set to expire, which would be good or bad, depending on where we are. And we have this deadline on a sequester if we don't have a budget agreement. So that is going to be a, an interesting time politically. So overall, I would say we did some of the right things uh, to deal with our man-made crisis, and I think financial reform was one of them. Uh, helping the economy recover was another. Um, but we still have a lot of work to do uh, to solve the long-run problems that were there before and that were exacerbated by the crisis. Thank you. Discussion and unless anyone who wants to speak um, before we open up to the floor, I would like to open up to the floor immediately. Is that okay? All right. So, anyone who has questions over there? Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, presentations. My name is Kawaguchi at the World Bank. I have one question to Professor Ito on the how to finance the reconstruction cost. And uh, one quick question to Professor Nomori or COG about the compact cities. Uh, about the cost, I agree with you on the, I think that the, the baby boomers uh, is very, yeah, is a good group to contribute to the uh, financing the reconstruction cost. And the, one of the very effective ways is, uh, of course, not the, uh, the income tax, but the, the agreement agreeing on the social security uh, reform. In other words, the agreeing on the some slight cut of the social security services like pensions or medical costs. So, how do you think uh, is it economically or politically uh, feasible for the government to convince them of the necessity of the uh, some significant uh, social uh, security reform? That is my first question. And the second question is uh, about the compact city, and my, uh, it is a very simple question. Who should uh, design the compact cities? There is, it, this should be the central government, uh, which might have the, some capacity or res resources, or the local government, uh, which uh, may capture the actual need of the, that specific area. That is my second question. Thank you very much. Okay, so the first question is um, uh, for me, and um, there are, there are various taxes, yes, income tax um, and uh, consumption tax, which is a value added tax, property tax, which is unfortunately the local tax, so it doesn't contribute to central government revenues, uh, corporate income tax, but we are talking about reducing corporate income tax uh, uh, in, uh, in view of that we are losing uh, uh, competition of the location of the uh, 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 firms. 
So, um, uh, and, and social security expenditure uh, uh, control, which you talked about. Um, realistically speaking, I think the uh, uh, consumption tax increase uh, is, um, is the uh, most promising one. And uh, we, our, our consumption tax is 5%, okay? And Sweden is 25%, and Greece is 23%. So the difference is about 20% 20 if we are to go to the European level. Suppose we go to 25%, then uh, we generate about 50 trillion yen, which will cover more than, uh, more than the current uh, uh, deficit, which is uh, 44 trillion yen in, uh, in uh, uh, new bond issues. So if we had the European level of uh, uh, consumption tax, we wouldn't have had this uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, fiscal uh, mess, the uh, high debt, high deficit society. Um, social security cut, social security benefit cut is another promising one because we are adding one trillion yen expenditure every year to ever increasing this. Um, uh, 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 retirees uh, who, who um, uh, you know, because of baby boomers will be retiring in uh, uh, in six to ten years. So um, uh, social security are bound to increase, and to cut that, uh, 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 the control is uh, necessary. How, to, how 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 would you do it? Uh, one is to uh, raise the retirement age from sixty five to sixty seven. That would so we have to continue working that um, and the university has to uh, change their um, uh, uh, their policy to uh, for, for the retirement age the US universities don't have retirement age but we do we uh, national university uh, professors retire at age 65 so raise it to 67 then we continue to work and contribute to the social equity contributions and delay our receipts of uh, uh, of the benefits that's one way to uh, do it. A more obvious way is to cut the, uh, cut the benefit outright. Um, so um, uh, those are the uh, menus which have been presented by economists. And your question is how to do it politically. Well, we need a strong leader. And we need someone who explains the dire situation of uh, uh, financial situations and convince the public that, yes, we need to do something about fiscal situation, and we have to raise consumption tax. We have to control the social security expenditure um, and uh, get consensus and, and carry out. Unfortunately, our politicians are worried about next election, not the future of the uh, uh, country or the next generation. So. Um, we really need a politician's reform. That's the, uh, and we, we need someone who, who can true. convince the uh, uh, populations. And compact cities? Compact cities. Compact cities. Oh, um, I to answer. Um, okay, um, I'm not a specialist on the technical issues, but uh, I think one thing, well, okay, first of all, this is not really happening, but if it were to happen, I think one thing for sure is that. We need the involvement of the local communities, not just the towns or villages, but the people who are actually living there. Because as I said during my presentation, um, one of the biggest concerns of doing this is that we may lose uh, you know, traditional ties, a traditional society, a traditional culture, and all those things. And uh, to minimize that risk or minimize that concern, uh, we need the involvement of not, not just the village offic officials level, people who are actually living there, you know, leaders of each community. And apparently, um, you know, it happens everywhere, but uh, people in one village usually don't like living with the next of its village. <laughs> I think it happens everywhere. So uh, to minimize all those uh, complaints and problems, I think the local involvement is going to be crucial if it were to happen. The Aomori city is supposed to be a frontier of the compact city. And they try to move, encourage 
move, moving the remote area resident into the downtown downtown Aomori because they, they want to save the uh, snow removal costs of the long roads to the remote uh, remote area. Um, so that's one example. Okay, good question. Yes. Right here. Ayuki uh, Monga, I'm a founding chair of the Washington Innovation Network. Uh, I want to ask you one uh, subject which has never been uh, discussed today on, uh, at the panel. That, that is, how much does the uh, science, technology, innovation, entrepreneurship could contribute to uh, the reconstruction? or a new development to the Japanese economy because uh, those areas are something which may bring more employment, more economic uh, inputs, and encourage the uh, most part of the population because innovation doesn't, not only young people, but also women and retirees. So I just wonder uh, how much these things will contribute to the development or expanding of the Japanese economy. Since, you know, uh, uh, Professor Shoji sounded a little bit uh, radical, so I will ask you this question first. Then I ask you, <laughs> Professor Mori, because you talked about uh, education policy. Thank you. Okay, um, did I sound radical? Um, <laughs> 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 sure. um, thank you. Um, as I started during my presentation, productivity growth is going to be the key. And therefore, the role of science, technology, innovation, that's enormous. Uh, that's the way we, that's the only way we can you know, continue to be a great nation. Um, but I would like to take a broader view of what innovation means. And when we talk about innovation, we're too much concerned, usually concentrated about you know, making things, basically manufa innovation manufacturing. Uh, but nowadays innovation, it's not called innovation statistics, but uh, important innovations happen in many cases elsewhere. Um, for example, if a care, people who are taking care of the elderly finds a better way to take care of them in a more comfortable way. Um, th that's probably not, doesn't show up as, you know, as an innovation in statistical sense, but that's probably more important than you know, the minor innovation in the factories. So um, including all those uh, things, uh, innovation holds a key to the success of the Japanese economy. That's Okay, uh, the very big problem in Japan is that uh, actually the corporate sector is uh, uh, actually the largest saver in the economy. You know, the Japanese households are very famous that uh, we uh, save a lot of money. You know, that uh, one time that maybe the savings rate of Japanese households is about, above 20%. And with that capital, the Japan could, you know, grow. But very recently, Jap Japanese household savings rate is uh, less than 5% or 3%, very low level. Who is that saving and who is financing the national budget deficit? Is that corporations? You know, usually corporations are expected to borrow money and invest in a productive you know, process and then return that, you know, that return to the individuals or the government. But in Japan, that what is happening is that they are saving money, not investing in the productive process, but paying back their debt. That's a real period. Uh, problem life. And uh, of course that innovation is a key word. You know, I talked about the Bank of Japan's you know, that, that stance. It's a you know, that profound frame, framework, but more you know, that important is the innovation. And uh, of course that Japanese universities or Japanese industries are thinking very you know, that, uh, uh, positively on this direction. And uh, maybe you know that 10 years ago it was so difficult to make a kind of industry academic you know uh, uh, collaboration. But now you know that all almost all national universities have such a you know, special department which promote industry and uh, uh, academic collaboration. And also for young generations, uh, three two three years ago 
the Kyoto University started to you know, that offer a new course or a new a new class. Uh, the, the entrepreneurship. The first year we got only 13 students. In the second year, we got 600 students who wanted to participate in it. I don't know how these professors you know, evaluate these students, but uh, anyway, that, that's a, you know, that one of the most popular classes in, in our university. So I think the young generations of Japan are very much interested in but uh, more in, uh, important is uh, how to you know, that make up a kind of uh, system to finance you know, that their activities. That, that's you know, that very important part. But I, I'm quite sure that that's the only way that we, we can promote this. If I may, um, you know, innovation sounds great, right? Uh, it's a um, big discovery, big change in uh, our production system or new discovery of uh, new technology and so on. Um, yes, they're fine, great, but we don't know it's we, we don't know for sure how to generate that. We have been talking about for the last 20 years and we didn't have that great innovations. So only gradual process of improvement uh, and so on. Yes, in the science they have discovery and so on, uh, but it doesn't contribute to a, a higher economic growth. It's tiny compared to the GDP. On our side, the social science, we, we, we know that several sectors are really behind. And we know if we do some structural reform, we can generate the uh, burst of energy in uh, production and, and so on. Take, for example, agriculture. They are so bound by the control of uh, pr price control, volume control, uh, and so on, which prohibits innovation. Okay? So um, this morning I was watching the uh, NHK um, World and, and saw the news program, which is the, someone started to import Chinese made rice and started selling in the supermarket, which is about 30% uh, 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 cheaper than uh, Japanese rice. 30, 30, Wait a second, 30%. If we unleash the Japanese farmers' uh, uh, you know, produ production uh, by just removing the uh, production control, uh, no, 30% price decline will happen. It's a Japanese policy which prohibits the farmers to get getting bigger and, and compete each other. And just, re, you know, just lifting the ban of those um, uh, uh, planting more rice will make those 30% easily. So um, uh, this is a policy which is, uh, which is uh, buying, uh, which is uh, sort of um, containing those uh, 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 energy for, for the uh, innovation uh, and which we call a structural reform. And uh, there are many areas, including medical care, including education, educational services, uh, which is controlled by price control, volume control, and other you know, intervention by, by, by the government. And I think there are, you know, easily we can, we can make the uh, production and, and GDP much higher by releasing those, um, uh, those, um, uh, those uh, 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 controls. Over there. My name is Takeuchi, I'm a, a Japanese journalist and a scholar uh, working in Johns Hopkins University. I think you have been concentrating on uh, macroeconomic uh, views, but, but uh, can I ask you, uh, industrial sector, um, um, it's a uh, nuclear uh, industries uh, of Japan. Actually, um, it is very controversial among you know, uh, Japanese people uh, how to keep the uh, export of nuclear plants or facilities to the uh, uh, mainly you know, uh, Asian developing countries. But, um, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Professor Ito uh, how, how you think about this uh, 
are still uh, you know, uh, do, you, do you support to promote uh, Japanese nuclear export to the other countries very strongly or, or how do you think of the contribution uh, to the world of Japanese nuclear industry? And also I'd like to ask the uh, same question, uh, Mr. Bailey. Uh, I'd like to ask you how you look at it. Uh, you have many uh, partners, business partners in, in the U.S. and uh, you're a pioneer of this industry. So I'd like to ask you first. The Japan has just signed the uh, uh, export of nuclear technology to Vietnam. And I think on the negotiation with uh, Turkey. Okay? So that's what the uh, question uh, is about. And um, um, the, um, uh, it's, it's not really pure Japanese technology. I think Toshiba has a um, uh, Westinghouse uh, uh, as a subsidiary. And they, they are doing the e export um, uh, of the technology. Uh, business and Hitachi is uh, with somebody else and, and um, um, basically if you choose again this is going to the probability stuff you know what, what is the probability of something going going wrong uh, but we learned a lesson from Fukushima Daiichi and I believe that newer technology is safer than old uh, uh, technology and if you choose carefully the location I think the uh, nuclear uh, power plant still has the um, uh, uh, possibility of um, uh, generating uh, electricity safely. So um, um, I, 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 I'm, not, uh, I'm not radical green. Um, I think um, I'm somewhere between a green and um, a blue. Uh, and um, um, I, 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 I think I, I, I would support, I would support the uh, nuclear energy um, technology export uh, from Japan because um, I, I think the fundamentally the newer newer technology is um, is um, uh, is safe. Um, but I'm I, you know uh, I, I think the um, following the Professor Mori's uh, presentation I'm I'm a bit skeptical of uh, government's effort to reopen all of the 54. Reactors. I don't think that that would happen. I think the government has to uh, pick and select the uh, uh, safer reactors, which is newer reactors and, and newer design uh, uh, and so on. But I'm not an expert on uh, reactors, so I have to. That's my impression. Um, you asked me to respond, and I'll respond not about the Japanese reactors, which I don't know enough about, but about the U.S. Um, I'm in favor of the continued use of nuclear power in, in the United States, and I have been in favor of it expanding its role in the future. Uh, we have to make a trade-off, and uh, you know, I don't, I'm not a scientist like many of you. I don't know what the um, carbon dioxide effect, the global warming effect, um, but it appears to be really quite dangerous if we continue to use as much uh, uh, CO2 as we're using and the generation of electricity, particularly in the United States, where we use a whole lot of electricity, and most of it has been generated through coal, uh, we are pumping out you know, uh, lots and lots and lots of CO2. So we have to find a, a greener way to do that, and I actually think nuclear power is a greener way uh, to do that. And I, I regret that Germany is shutting down, or going to shut down its nuclear plants. I think it's, uh, I would hate to see Japan shut down its uh, nuclear plants. We made uh, nuclear power uneconomical in the U.S. because after Three Mile Island and then the, the uh, accident in, the, in uh, Russia, uh, everybody got so scared and put on so many safety requirements that, that really the capital cost became so high that it was no longer feasible uh, to build nuclear power plants. I am in favor of, of having safe plants, um, so I don't think we should eliminate all that regulation, but I think we should move to find ways to do nuclear power safely. Uh, may not be ideal to have a nuclear plant sitting on the Hudson River a few miles upstream of, of New York City. Maybe that's something we think about. Maybe it's not good to have a nuclear power plant sitting in a place where it could be affected by a, a tsunami. Uh, but I think there are ways of making that nuclear power safe and we have to do it uh, economically. In the short run, I think we're going to do a lot with natural gas, as, as was said earlier, both in the United States and elsewhere. But in the long run, I think nuclear power is going to have to be uh, one of the important ways that we 
we generate electricity if we're not going to fry our planet uh, along the way. One, one difference between uh, Japan and the U.S. on the nuclear power plant is that uh, in Japan it's owned by the uh, power company and each company has several uh, nuclear power plants. Uh, it used to be like that in the U.S., but in the U.S., uh, in, in the course of the deregulation that um, many nuclear power plants are concentrated into one company, and of course the power generation distributions are separated uh, uh, in the U.S. So by scale economy, by, by uh, putting the knowledge about nuclear uh, power plants, reactors, uh, uh, they, I think they, they increase, the U.S. increase the uh, efficiency of the uh, uh, generation, which is a shortening the, um, uh, uh, the maintenance period uh, and, and so on. And I, I believe, it's my sort of impression, that they also increase the learning about the safety uh, 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 by running many reactors at the same time. And, and the, French, the French do a pretty good job on right. that. Too. Yeah, I think that uh, the, the, we have to think about the role of uh, Tempuco. You know, Tokyo Electric uh, Corporation, because that, uh, in order to sell you know, that your nuclear reactors to any country, you, you, you need uh, not only the hardware, but also at the same time software, you know, that how to operate. And the TEPCO played a very important role so far in the past, but now TEPCO is not in a position to do that. So it means that, you know, that we have to, or when we want to proceed with this, uh, we have really to think about the reorganizing you know, that the structure of technical maybe you know divide to two entities one is a distribution of electricity one is more you know, concentrated on the electric electricity production how, how to organize that's a very important question i think you have a question here well perhaps i could uh, follow up on this coming at it maybe from a, a greener side uh, uh, when I was a graduate student in the 60s uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, I had the privilege of having as uh, graduate student colleagues uh, many very bright uh, Japanese students who went back uh, and um, uh, had prominent roles in, in Japanese uh, physics education. Uh, at that time, the, there was a huge uh, focus on semiconductor physics. That physics is the basis of photovoltaic energy. Uh, so I have the impression that Japan has a very strong uh, knowledge base uh, in semiconductors. Of course, you did a lot for a long time in, in the electronics industry before you went to China. Uh, but I would propose uh, to uh, Professors Mori and Shoji that uh, you think harder about uh, not uh, uh, replacing old nuclear plants with new nuclear plants, whatever you do with the new ones, but moving right away to photovoltaic energy, even if there's a, a slight cost differential, uh, given the, uh, the uh, intangibles uh, related both to uh, uh, safety and, and public acceptability, uh, as well as the, uh, the non-proliferation issues that we heard about this morning, um, and taking into account the, the extraordinary uh, uh, reduction in the cost of, of photovoltaic uh, power over the last couple of years, uh, while uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Bailey has pointed out the cost of nuclear, at least here, has, has gone up, and, and if there are additional safety uh, it, the requirements imposed as a result of uh, uh, Fukushima, uh, I don't see that uh, upfront cost going down. Uh, the cost comparison, of course, is much uh, more difficult given uh, levelizing the cost across uh, the generation and the fact that solar is, is not 24-7 uh, the way nuclear is, although even nuclear shuts down every year for refuel. But perhaps you might want to say something about whether that could be done more rapidly since both of you identified solar energy as a possibility for the future and Japan has this strong uh, background here. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, that's uh, you know, relating to the, my uh, last you know, that, uh, message about the typical. Uh, the, the very important is that, uh, how to diversify you know, Japan's energy sources. And uh, so far, you know, the Japanese energy industry thought that, you know, that to uh, make, I don't know exactly, but half of our energy you know, resource uh, comes from the, this uh, uh, nuclear. But uh, I think that, uh, and they showed always that how cheap is that, you know, that uh, uh, nuclear energy is. 
that's a chart, that, uh, that was the cheapest according to their calculation, but it didn't include many factors, mm -hmm. not. For example, the government you know, subsidized many local governments you know, to accept the you know, establishing you know, nuclear reactors in these areas. So that cost was not included. And also the this waste, you know, the nuclear waste cost, deposition cost was not included. And and also the this current you know, that, uh, nuclear uh, disaster you know, settlement cost was not included. So when we add up these costs, maybe nuclear is not so cheap. You know, but then how we can do it you know, that, to replace these nuclear, you know, that special old ones with the other you know, energy source? Uh, the, the, the we have you know that uh, the idea that we are discussing in Japan is that to you know, that to reorganize these corporations to have distribution and the energy production, and then uh, they, they have to compete not only the nuclear energy but also other you know, natural resources, uh, natural you know, the energy renewable you know, energy sources should be, compete. But we have to have some that for the time being you know, as such. I don't know how it works, but that's the only way that we can do it. So Owen has a tells me zero minutes, but I recognize two last questions over there. No? Okay, one last question over there. Thank you, I'll be quick. I'm Eri Tamagawa, a senior student of University of Tokyo Faculty of Law, and I'm here as a leader of student project on March 11 with students from Tohoku in Tokyo. I'd like to ask a very simple question. Um, I believe Japanese youth's power is needed for reconstruction of Japan. However, according to Professor Shioji, uh, we will be taxed, taxed, and taxed. <laughs> so, how can we make merit for Japanese people, especially Japanese youth, to work inside Japan? Thank you. I don't mean just taxing young people. I'll, I think, okay, um, to, it wasn't today's topic, but the, the biggest problem in Japan by far is the intergenerational inequality. And I'm not just talking about money, I'm talking more, more about opportunities. Okay? So, um, when I was uh, graduating from college, um, there wasn't so much problem of finding a job, a decent job. But uh, now, you know, my students are really bright and they work harder than you know when we were college students. We were just watching TV, but now, now students are very serious and they work hard and still they manage to find no job. Um, so um, I do realize that this intergenerational inequality thing is very important, and therefore um, when I say tax, um, I'm not just talking about taxing the young people, um, the old people. Or, well, at least uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> no. Well, Professor Ito has promised to contri keep contributing after uh, 2060. So, so, um, uh, so. Um, yeah, um, so I think if we don't if we don't start taxing even graduate now, that means even more burden shifted toward the young people, young generation. I think that was also a point raised by Professor Ito exactly that we can't just keep shifting all the burdens to the younger generation. Um, therefore, um, we have to start soon. Uh, if Professor Ito says it maybe now, and I said maybe two or three years. But uh, I think that was uh, the main message that we're trying to convey here. So I, I'm actually quite sympathetic to your pleasure. Yeah, so <laughs> so um, uh, like, uh, like, uh, as I mentioned, the current government plan is to issue bonds now and pay for by 25 years of income tax increase. But many of our baby boomers will retire in, in, in six years and don't pay income taxes after that. Okay? Mm -hmm. So young people like you should protest. Go to the streets <laughs> and protest the government. That's not the way to do it. And introduce consumption tax, which will be paid for our baby boomers continuously until we die. And uh, you know, rich, rich uh, elderly will consume. Right? That's very fair tax. 
the rich people who consume more will pay taxes. So the young people should, should, should go to the street, protest <laughs> consumption tax now <laughs> instead of income tax. Those intergenerational conflict, which Shiyoji-san mentioned, is not in the debate. That's very uh, surprising, shocking, that mass media ignores those uh, young people's interests. Young people should complain, protest, and no income tax, but consumption tax. That's, that's your benefit. Okay. Okay. So unfortunately, <laughs> time is up. Okay. So um, uh, we we had a great discussion in in session three two, and um, uh, we thank you for the audience for the great uh, uh, interest that you made. Thank you. Thank you very much for the panel. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce the chairman of USJI and a professor from Tokyo and vice president. Dr. Akiko Tanaka. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of the one of the sponsors, uh, organizers of uh, this symposium, uh, US Japan Research Institute, uh, I would like to extend uh, my gratitude to uh, the two keynote speakers. Uh, uh, Professor Arima and Professor von Hippel, uh, and all other panelists of the three sessions, and a uh, great audience here uh, for attending uh, this symposium. Um, also, I would like to uh, extend my personal thanks to our co organizer, uh, Japan Society for the Promotion of uh, Science, particularly Professor uh, Sugawara and uh, his staff. Um, USJI is very happy and honored uh, to have uh, worked with JSBS uh, Washington office to realize uh, today's uh, symposium entitled uh, Risk Management from Natural Disaster to Economy. I think uh, this theme was extremely appropriate uh, given the fact that it took one, it had one year passed after March uh, 11. Um, uh, the, today's discussion, all speeches uh, uh, demonstrated the relevance uh, of uh, today's uh, topic. The USJI, uh, US Japan Research Institute, uh, was uh, established about three years ago. Uh, and has been working uh, mainly on uh, social science uh, related uh, policy uh, studies. But uh, uh, this uh, uh, Washington based uh, institute was found, founded by the five uh, universities uh, Waseda, Keio, uh, Kyoto, Rismekan, and uh, Tokyo. Um, and these five universities, uh, all research uh, universities uh, with comprehensive uh, academic uh, disciplines. And so um, we uh, have been thinking of uh, expanding the scope of our um, uh, activities of USJI uh, for uh, some months. And so when Professor Sagawara of uh, JSPS uh, uh, suggested uh, the risk management as uh, the uh, topic of uh, this joint uh, effort, um, we were uh, gratified uh, that uh, this could uh, broaden uh, the uh, uh, scope of uh, the subject matter of USJI. Um, as was mentioned, uh, uh, risks uh, coming from both uh, natural uh, phenomena and unnatural uh, man-made uh, phenomena. And uh, uh, tackling uh, these ris risks uh, is uh, really an uh, interdisciplinary uh, uh, endeavor. Um, and uh, today's uh, uh, discussion uh, all revealed the um, necessity uh, of uh, connecting uh, natural sciences, engineering, 
and uh, social science and humanities uh, knowledge. And then also, uh, this, uh, today's discussion uh, revealed how difficult uh, it is to connect these technical uh, aspects and social uh, aspects. But the difficulty, uh, it seems to me, does not uh, uh, justify absence of such activities. And I think uh, reflecting on, uh, I believe, the success of uh, this symposium, uh, the US uh, JI uh, is uh, going to uh, uh, further activate our um, activities in both Washington DC and elsewhere in the United States and in Japan uh, to incorporate uh, the, uh, the subject matter that are related uh, to uh, the concerns of the people both in the United States and uh, Japan. Um, the, uh, we uh, are very uh, happy, as I to repeat, uh, that we have the uh, opportunity to work with uh, JSPS. Uh, and uh, uh, as uh, further occasions arise, we would like to uh, continue to work together uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, also, I appreciate very much that uh, uh, the um, younger members of uh, uh, um, Japanese public, uh, including students, uh, uh, decided to come and join our sessions and uh, raise uh, questions. Um, uh, whether uh, Professor Ito's agitation uh, work or not, I don't know, but uh, uh, we are very much uh, hopeful uh, that with the participation of uh, younger generation, we would like to continue to activate our, our uh, research uh, and educational activities through the U.S. Yeah. On behalf of the Institute, I'd like to uh, thank you again, and with this I would like to conclude the symposium. Thank you very much.